Hey, thanks everyone for joining our UC a &R monthly water webinar. And today I'm really delighted to uh, have one of my colleague, Michelle Infriller Miles. Um, she is a um, Delta Crops Resource Management Advisor um, focused on the San Joaquin, Sacramento, Solano and Costa, uh, Contra Costa counties. Uh, and Michelle is a native to San Joaquin, um, I believe. Uh, is that correct, Michelle? Yeah, yeah. yeah um, and you got your bachelor's at UC Davis and master's and PhD from Cornell University. Um, and in your in Michelle's uh, advisor role, she's mostly focused on uh, doing applied research um, and extension work related to um, you know uh, crop management, water management, crop production, um, soil resource management, and so on and so forth. Um, so with that, Michelle, take it away. Okay. Um, well, I just want to start by thanking Safiq and Ellen for inviting me to present during the water webinar series this year. And I know this is the last one of the year. So thanks to everybody who's joined in um, late on a Friday um, at the end of the academic year. Um, so as Safiq said, I'm a farm advisor uh, with UC Cooperative Extension. I'm, I serve a five county region uh, and Safiq named off all of those counties, but I'm based in San Joaquin County um, where I, I grew up uh, and uh, my family still farms here. So I'm really fortunate, I think, to be able to um, do this work in extension in the place where I, I grew up and in this place that means so much to me. Um, I've been in this role for 10 years now. So uh, in this presentation, I'm gonna kind of give a thumbnail sketch of a lot of different things that I've done over the last several years at least. Um, my presentation, I'll start off just really briefly talking about ANR and UC Cooperative Extension. Um, it could be that somebody or everybody's given uh, some update or a, a you know, brief description of the organization, but I'll start off that way too, because I think it, it leads well into the other things that I wanna talk about, um, including my Delta Research and Extension uh, program, the needs that I'm trying to address um, from the folks in the agricultural community I'll talk a little bit about my extension philosophy and the research collaborations that I've had over the last few years. So ANR and cooperative extension, even, even people who work for ANR work in the division sometimes are a little bit confused about how to define the two things. So basically um, the UC ANR is the division of the University of California that administers cooperative extension. So I basically describe ANR as the administrative unit um, and cooperative extension is really the, that program uh, based in the counties that delivers information to local communities. Um, there's 178 advisors uh, across 57 of the 58 counties. And there are specialists based at uh, three UC campuses and nine research and extension centers. Uh, ANR also administers other statewide programs. And I've shown a few of the emblems there at the bottom, like Master Gardeners and IPM and 4-H and Master Food Preservers, but there's other statewide programs that the division um, delivers throughout the state of California for um, local communities, be them youth or farmers or um, you know, gardeners or the general public. And then what can cooperative extension specifically do for Californians? Um, in, in my realm, um, we collaborate with people on research. Um, we do field diagnostics. We deliver information and then of course there are those programs and volunteer opportunities where Californians can engage with cooperative extension and UC ANR. And we promote um, uh, local economies and protect natural resources. These are some of the public values that um, ANR delivers. And then a quote um, from an uh, ANR web from the website and one of our ANR um, documents is. You know, 
cooperative extension has been around for over 100 years now. And I think the thing that was really appealing to me about cooperative extension and why I really sought it out for my career is that we get to do science and we get to work in our communities. We get to become experts at things and work with people um, and develop those relationships that um, help us to hopefully um, impart change or, or at least improve our, our community in, in some small way. Um, and so it's really kind of that boots on the ground experience that I really value. And, um, you know, I, I appreciate being able to um, have. So now I'm going to kind of segue into the Delta and um, the research and extension needs that um, I have come to realize in my years as the Delta Crops Advisor. Uh, recognizing that the Delta is a really um, diverse place. Um, it's a complex system and a complex ecosystem. And so the needs of the Delta certainly go beyond the things that I'm going to talk about. The things that I'm gonna talk about primarily address agricultural needs and some of the soil and water resource management needs in the agricultural system. So the Delta, um, it, there's actually six counties that are in the Delta. My um, uh, job description identifies five of them that um, have the most area. You can see in that um, map on the left, there's this little sliver of Alameda County or this little triangle down there where there, there's a little bit of agriculture, but there's also, it's kind of where the state and um, Central Valley projects, the, the water projects, come to, to triangulate right there. But the agricultural land is really all throughout the San Joaquin, Sacramento, Yolo, Solano, and Contra Costa counties, um, where San Joaquin County has, has the most area of the Delta among those five counties, or even six. <laughs> um, the Delta has these two zones. These um, zones, are described as the primary zone and the secondary zone. The primary zone is, um, I believe, statutorily defined as um, a land and water area of statewide significance. And so generally speaking, the primary zone is an area where development really doesn't happen um, in terms of urban development. It's it's natural and agricultural and um, any kind of urban development is um, required to stay outside of the primary zone, um, but can happen in that secondary zone that you see in the map. The Delta has about 738,000 acres in total and about 400,000 acres are in agricultural production. And this map here in the center of the screen is, it comes from um, a project that I, I was a contributor on um, where we looked at crop consumptive use and we mapped out the different crops that, that grow in the Delta. And I think what is really striking by the map there is, um, just the diversity of crops that are, are shown, that are depicted there. Um, uh, there are many different type, types of, of crops, over at least over 70 different types of crops. And, um, and agriculture in the Delta is worth about a, a billion dollars annually. And then the final map uh, on the right-hand side um, it's showing a couple of different things that um, are unique challenges for Delta agriculture. Um, and they really, uh, the Delta is really this nexus for agriculture and the environment. So one of the things that it depicts is land subsidence and the areas that are colored in red are areas of high subsidence. Um, where the land area is below sea level, sometimes as low as 25 feet below sea level. But what the map is also showing is that um, this is an interface between seawater and freshwater. And uh, the Delta delivers about half of the state's runoff 
Um, and that water that flows through the delta is used for irrigation. But what can be very challenging, um, while the, the delta seems quite rich when it comes to water, um, because of how much water is coming together right there, um, it's, it's often degraded by the time uh, it's available for use. So sometimes that is influenced by seawater coming up from the Pacific Ocean, um, but sometimes it's influenced by upstream uses and reuses, and then that um, flowing down through the rivers and the channels that come into the Delta. So the Delta has, like I said, over 70 different crops, uh, at least. Um, when I began working as a farm advisor, one of the most important things I thought I needed to do was understand uh, if I'm going to be called the Delta Crops Resource Management Advisor, what are the Delta crops? What, what should I be focusing my work on? Um, and field crops at that time and even today are the predominant crops, at least in terms of area in the Delta. And so you're seeing a few different field crops that, I, that I've worked on, uh, sorghum, rice, wheat, corn, which is primarily grown for grain, um, dry beans and alfalfa. Uh, these aren't always considered the highest value crops. In fact, um, tomatoes and wine grapes are probably the highest value crops in the Delta. But when it comes to considering the amount of land area, and again, that nexus between agriculture and the environment, I thought it was really important to focus on those crops that occupy the most land. Um, pasture is also um, an important uh, land use in the Delta, but my uh, research program primarily focuses on cultivated crops. And then we often think of the soils in the Delta as being that rich organic soil, uh, muck soils that are derived from plant material, basically. Um, and these are very fertile soils. Um, but where the challenge lies is that um, they're susceptible to oxidation and um, it, this can result in um, loss of soil carbon, that subsidence issue that I talked about before and the low elevation of, of soil compared to the water. Um, and then, you know, there are some other environmental conditions that, that are challenging for the agriculture community for, for the state as we uh, manage our resources. Um, the subsidence issues can result in, um, uh, you know, we have a, a, a shallow root zone in some areas of the Delta where um, groundwater is um, maybe two, three or four feet below the surface of the soil. Um, salinity can build up in the soil, again, from water uses prior to that water coming into the delta for um, irrigation. Um, and soils are very variable. One of the picture at the bottom left is to try to illustrate that, and even the one to the right of it, where you can see all those different color variations in the soil that can mean um, challenges in, in how we manage um, you know, it's not a consistent soil type. And, and so sometimes soil quality um, can be extremely variable even within one field, not to mention um, from one ranch to another or from one end of the Delta to the other. Um, I've, I've talked about water used for irrigation. So water in the Delta, um, or excuse me, surface water in the Delta is what's used for irrigation. Growers aren't using groundwater. Um, and, and water flows by siphon, you can see in the bottom right picture, um, by gravity into um, Delta Islands where it's used for irrigation. And then the water um, will, has to get pumped off of the island um, into uh, channels to keep, um, to keep the water from, the groundwater from becoming too high in the root zone to, um, from being saturated. And so that's a really unique um, 
condition of Delta agriculture. Um, it means that um, much of the Delta, most growers have a riparian water right, which is the most senior water right um, in, in the California water rights system. Um, and uh, there's very little cost to um, having that water flow onto the land. Um, the primary cost is in getting the water back off of the land by pumping it back into the channels. So I, I mentioned that one of the first things that I did as a farm advisor was um, assess the crop makeup in the Delta to just understand, take, get that understanding for what are Delta crops. Um, but just a couple of years ago, the agronomy program team um, decided to take on a statewide needs assessment and survey growers and consultants statewide. And um, these results come from that statewide survey um, San Joaquin and Sacramento growers uh, consisted of about 31% of the survey respondents. And so I was really pleased to have such a high um, response rate from my clientele, because it means that I could sort out some of the, um, sort out the survey responses and, and really hone in, sorry, my light is an automatic light and just shut off. Um, it means that I, it meant I could really hone in on um, what are the needs and the challenges of, of the community that I'm serving? Um, so here are some of the things that they identified. And again, these, these results are surveyed or sorted for San Joaquin and Sacramento um, uh, uh, respondents. So the top field crops, agronomic crops, because that's what we were focusing on with this survey, were alfalfa, dry beans, uh, grain and silage corn, um, and, and small grains, wheat or uh, small grains for forage. And you can see what some of their top management challenges were, um, irrigation, weed management or other pest management um, and nutrient management. And then you can also see um, what are some of their primary reasons for growing these crops and uh, profitability is named, crop rotation benefits, and, and tradition were all named as reasons for growing um, these crops. And then um, we also asked them to um, help us to understand their, their priorities of these different disciplines um, as they relate to agronomic crops production. And here I've highlighted some of the highest priority areas, including irrigation management or crop water requirements nutrient management, um, insect and disease control, and testing new products. And some other high priority areas um, include water conservation, soil health, uh, weed control, and variety testing. Um, many of these topics were things I was, I was already working, for, working on, and so I was I was pleased to see that these are things that are important to them, but certainly it's, it's it's my role um, as an advisor um, serving my community to, to learn what their needs are and to adapt my program if need be, to make sure that I'm addressing things that are important to them. Also keeping in mind, you know, there are other reasons we may do research projects, um, our own expertise or statewide needs, but certainly clientele needs are, are at the forefront of the things that we do. And so my program basically um, is organized under two themes, including agronomic crops production and soil and water resource management, which of course is the primary focus of my talk today. But before I get into some of my specific research, I just wanted to take a few minutes to talk about my extension philosophy. And this was only something I started thinking about in, in maybe the last year or two, um, it wasn't, uh, thinking about an extension philosophy wasn't something I, I came into this job thinking I would need to develop one or um, really being especially attuned to it. Um, but I think it's, it's through interactions with colleagues um, that I've come to think about it a little bit more and um, like to share it with others, especially new advisors. Um, who 
might be coming in with um, questions about, you know, what does it mean to be an extension agent? And so I've shown a couple things there on the screen, including a, a book by Faith Kearns that she recently wrote and the Water Talk podcast, where um, these colleagues of mine have welcomed me to talk about what I do and um, kind of the philosophy behind what I do. And one way that I characterized it to colleagues uh, doing during a new advisor orientation a few years ago is um, I called it little, little less science or little science, uh, as opposed to say big, big data or big science. Um, I think it's really important as advisors that we work on things that have short, medium and long-term outcomes. And so I, I use this phrase little s science to basically characterize the things that have short-term um, outcomes for clientele that provide results that they can put into practice. Um, if they can put things into practice, if they find what, what I'm doing or what other farm advisors are doing really usable, then it's gonna help build our relationships with them. So for example, one of the things that I, I've done over several years is monitor armyworms and rice. Um, I go out there, I deploy these bucket traps that you see on the left side, and I count moths. Um, and this is a pest monitoring strategy. These armyworms can eat the rice and decrease yields. And so they're really an important pest for growers. And we, we can go out there and just spray arbitrarily for the worms, or we can monitor their populations and help to guide growers on whether the population is severe enough to uh, treat them, or if it is, what's the, the best timing to treat them so that we're, we're making the best use of a, a spray application or, or inputs and, and, and costs. Um, but the relationships that I've built by doing kind of that little less science um, provide opportunities for bigger science. And so when I can deliver on things that growers can use in a short, uh, a short matter of time, then um, when I go to them and ask to do things like, uh, you know, work on these larger team projects to uh, look at cover cropping or crop evapotranspiration, they're, they're willing to try these things that, that might be a little bit of an imposition to them, um, but they, they've come to realize the value of the science and the practical nature of the science that we're doing. So another example of um, putting little less science into practice is my work in rice. Uh, rice is it's a crop in the Delta that is growing in acreage, but it's not a substantial amount of, of acreage, especially compared to the Sacramento Valley where most of the state's rice is, is grown. Um, my programmatic activities have, again, looked at army worms, uh, doing some herbicide efficacy work, weedy rice management with weedy rice is, a, is another pest in the rice system, and variety evaluations. These are some of those things uh, that hopefully we can produce results in, in the short term that growers can use. But in supporting growers in cultivating rice, by helping new growers um, become rice growers, um, we're supporting them in a production system that also helps to tackle things like carbon oxidation, soil subsidence, water system stability and greenhouse gas mitigation. And there's just a, a screenshot of a paper um, that addresses how, that talks about how rice um, and the, the flooded rice system helps to mitigate some of these um, environmental challenges that we face in the Delta. So again, the little less science helps, helps us to um, get at some of that bigger, bigger data or that, um, you know, those really uh, challenge, challenging things that we face um, in this system. But communication is key. Um, and so it's, it's important to recognize that your grower or clientele community don't have, 
you know, endless time to, to listen to you or drive all over creation to meet with you. It's important to try to meet them where they are, um, deliver on farm research whenever possible that they can go out and see and, and show them how things are working. And then to um, kind of digest material and put it um, in an interface that, that, that they prefer, that they like to use. And through our, our statewide needs assessment a couple of years ago, you know, we learned a lot about um, clientele preferences, how they like to receive, it, receive information. And newsletters and websites and blogs are, are really important sources of information for them. And, uh, you know, Cooperative Extension can produce those or somebody else can produce those. But if somebody else is producing those, then, you know, they're not they're not getting our work. And hopefully that's that's what we want them to get is is um, practical, non-biased um, scientific work. Um, but remembering, again, that communication is not just a one way street. It's important to deliver information, but it's also important to, to receive it too. And certainly the statewide needs assessment was one way that we tried to get their feedback, but certainly ongoing conversations are a really important part of that too. And then just finally, my, my extension activities, I see policy engagement as being another really important way um, to deliver information. And some of my engagement has been through California water fix hearings and water quality control board hearings, and then just serving on um, uh, uh, task forces and committees with um, Delta agencies. Um, you know, sitting in, in hearing rooms and uh, being on the hot seat isn't exactly a comfortable place to be. And I certainly don't speak the language of lawyers, uh, which is often the language that's primarily spoken during those hearings. Um, and it's not for everybody either, but, you know, certainly serving on task forces, serving on committees is a really a great way to get engaged with policy or rulemaking. And, and probably it's, it's really important for cooperative extension to be doing those sorts of things. Um, we have this really interesting relationship between clientele and between these um, policy groups and between the scientific community too. Um, so we serve as a really important hub for these different groups of people. So I'll spend the rest of my time talking about some of the um, research collaborations that I've developed over the last few years that link soil and water resource management in the Delta. And I'm gonna talk uh, quite a lot about soil, even though this is a water webinar, um, and talk about soil health, um, which I, I know there have been other um, uh, speakers during this water, water webinar series that have talked about soil health. So this is just a really uh, brief description and diagram to illustrate what it means. It's really this, um, this, this soil functioning, this, this uh, integration of soil biological, physical, and chemical characteristics that help soil to deliver on some sort of function. And of course, in, in my world, in my my uh, line of work, that would be um, crop production. And we know that there are management practices in our crop production systems that affect soil health and influence soil water dynamics, things like crop rotation, compost amendment, tillage and cover cropping. These are things where research has shown that diversifying um, plant species, keeping a living root in the soil, uh, increasing organic matter by um, applying amendments. These are all ways that we can um, improve upon some of the desirable soil characteristics like soil structure and nutrient cycling and microbial activity and reduce the things that are undesirable like compaction and pest pressure and, and carbon oxidation among other things. So a few years ago, I um, teamed up with a large, a large team of other farm advisors and um, 
extension specialists and professors on the UC Davis campus um, to do this multi-site evaluation of soil health practices. And with Brenna Agater, my uh, San Joaquin County colleague, we um, developed a, a project looking at warm season legume cover cropping in the Delta. So cover cropping is not a typical practice in the annual systems of the Delta, um, but, but the Delta is a place where um, waterways can supply irrigation water in the summer for the most part. Um, of course, there are extreme drought situations that might make that less feasible in the future. Um, but in general, um, surface waterways provide irrigation water that, that could be used for cover cropping when land would otherwise be fallowed. So for example, um, between um, small grains winter cropping, um, uh, small grains are grown during the, the fall winter season, harvested in, in the late spring or early summer. And we saw, saw this as an opportunity to apply a cover crop during those summer months before perhaps another small grains crop coming up in the following fall. And our question of interest was whether a summer cover crop could improve soil tilth at a time of year when the soil would have otherwise been fallowed and kept dry with no soil cover. And we were also, for practical reasons, wondering whether there were agronomic practices that would make it um, more feasible for farmers to employ cover cropping during the summer, recognizing that it wasn't a typical practice, probably for some reasons, right? Growers would be doing it if, um, if it was a sure thing. So our trial design was to look at uh, really simply a cover crop versus a standard dry fallow between winter small grains. This was a field that was difficult to irrigate. Um, and so the grower primarily used it for um, small grains that were rain fed that, that didn't need to be irrigated. They relied on the rainfall generally for this field. Um, we had a, a three replicate block over four acres in a commercial field. We planted a cowpea cover crop, so a leguminous cover crop, and we were hoping that the legume would provide uh, benefits like fixing nitrogen. Um, they grow well in the summer when the soil is warm, and they're moderately tolerant of salinity, which can sometimes be a problem in delta soils. We did anticipate challenges like moisture, obviously, because it's summer and it's dry, and uh, pest pressure, primarily weeds, because um, after all, a cover crop is, is not something that growers want to put a lot of inputs into, so they wouldn't necessarily be um, spraying a herbicide to manage weeds, for example. Um, uh, but because we would be applying irrigation to the cover crop, when the soil would have otherwise been fallow, we anticipated there, there would be weeds growing up as well. And here are um, some of the results that we found. After three years of cover cropping, there were no, no differences in the total nitrogen, um, in the bulk density of the soil, or in the total carbon. There, there was a, a a statistical interaction between the treatment and, uh, and the block. But when you inter interpose the, the data over a map of the, the trial, basically the western, ed the western half of the trial had higher carbon than the eastern half of the, uh, the trial. And we had basically attributed it to some inherent soil characteristics. We, we tried to block for um, soil texture uh, the soil classification, um, but in this case, uh, it, it still kind of teased out that way, um, showing that carbon really wasn't influenced by the cover crop treatment in just, you know, this was a short-term trial, a three-year trial. But where we did see something interesting was with salinity, and we saw that in the cover crop treatments after three years, um, soil salinity was lower than the no cover crop treatment. Um, and while, um, you know, th this may not come as a huge surprise, we were applying irrigation water only to the cover crop treatments, not to the no cover crop treatments. 
And so, um, and, and the water quality was, was quite good over the period of this, this trial. Um, and so in that case, we, we would imagine we, we weren't putting a lot of salt on, we were able to, to move salt down below the root zone. But I think the, the interesting point that I wanted to make with the grower community is that in that no cover crop treatment, there wasn't even enough rainfall to mitigate um, soil salinity buildup. So you see that orange line and over time, you, you saw the salinity go up from where it was at the beginning of the trial. Um, and so in, in periods of drought um, or perhaps in a change in climate where less precipitation is expected, um, then you know, in this case, having a summer cover crop where, where we really didn't apply that much water, I think we put on about six inches of water total for, for each season. Um, it, it was enough to help mitigate um, soil salinity to keep it from building up. Another promising thing that we saw was that the cover crop helped to improve water infiltration after those three years. Um, you can see in the photograph there, um, there's, there's these sections of the photo. So right up at the, at the bottom of the photo, which would be the, the foreground, um, the soil was very powdery. And then as you moved into that first um, block of the cover crop treatment, the soil was better aggregated and it resulted in, in better water infiltration. So I would say that that was a really um, promising thing to see. And um, we not only saw it in the data, like the grower, the grower was really um, happy and impressed to see that kind of result. But one of the challenges that we had was, um, again, by applying irrigation water, um, we had weeds come up and we also had volunteer triticale. So seed that had shattered off of the plants that didn't get harvested um, from the previous season or seasons before, it, it also germinated. Now, I didn't see the triticale, the volunteer triticale as being a problem for this cover crop, um, because oftentimes growers are planting a mixed species cover crop anyway. Um, triticale is a grass, and so it would provide more biomass and therefore more carbon or nitrogen inputs. Well, at least carbon for sure. Um, and, and then the legume mixed in would again fix nitrogen. So those, the, the combination of uh, triticale as a grass and cowpea as a nitrogen fixer is, is a pretty good combination um, for, for a cover crop anyway. But of course, you see the Johnson grass there, which is not as desirable thing to be irrigating and uh, culturing. And um, you see in that middle pie chart that in, in 2019, the weeds basically got away from us and, and were more prevalent than either the volunteer triticale or, or the cowpea. So it, it's, um, it's a challenge with cover cropping um, and uh, you know not one to be dismissed because if those weeds go to seed, then they can be problematic um, for years to come. And also something that's not to be dismissed, but maybe challenging to explain is that um, we did see that um, the no cover crop had a higher yield than the cover crop. So we would have liked to, seen, to have seen that the cover crop treatment, the soil building practice would also help to improve yields. Um, we didn't see that um, over a couple of cropping seasons. Um, it could be that it, it just needs more time. Um, you know, soil building practices generally don't turn around in a short amount of time, just like that soil carbon result didn't, didn't show a difference. Um, and so maybe over time, we wouldn't see this kind of um, impact on yield, um, but at least in the short term, we, we, we did. Um, and it's something that we're not exactly sure how to explain as of yet. But another important part of the project was also looking at greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and, and they were minimally affected by cover crop, which I guess is in some ways good and maybe uh, some ways not so good. Um, we wouldn't want to certainly see an, a, a huge increase in greenhouse gas emissions from a cover crop. 
And, you know, maybe we would, um, just theoretically speaking, um, the cover crop increase, increases microbial activity. So we did see an increase in CO2 emissions. Um, but one of the positive things is that a, a leguminous cover crop can sometimes uh, has been shown to emit more nitrous oxide. In this case, we didn't see higher nitrous oxide emissions. So that was a good thing. Um, we also saw these small fluxes in methane, but we weren't able to statistically attribute those to um, the cover crop treatment. So some of our lessons learned and grower guidance that we've been providing up based on this trial is that the timing of operations had a big impact. And I didn't really talk about that today, um, but we, over the three years, had different timings of planting and cover crop termination. And for this summer cover crop, it really was most successful when we could get in there earlier, late May, and then terminate earlier, like late July. Um, and also the irrigation method is something I didn't really address today. Um, but we uh, had flood irrigation in the first year and sprinkler irrigation in the second and third years. And that sprinkler irrigation was a lot better at this site. Um, a lot more, um, the, the flood irrigation, um, I think just put too much water on at one time and the cowpea didn't respond very well to that. But the intermittent inter irrigations of sprinklers seem to help um, withstand establishment. Speaking of stand establishment, it was challenged by volunteer grain and weed competition. Um, but again, we, we chose not to manage those things. We, we chose to just let them go and um, kind of see how they would influence the carbon and nitrogen cycling at this site. Um, but certainly for a grower who's looking to implement cover cropping on a large scale, those things would um, be serious things to consider so that the grower's not um, increasing the weed seed bank by too much. Um, the benefits of cover cropping may not be realized after a few years. Um, this could hinder long-term adoption. Um, certainly it's, it's not easy to convey results that are negative or, or that are just static. Um, and, and so I think some longer term studies are needed um, in cover cropping in general in California, across you know microclimates in, in California and different soils in California. Um, but certainly the summer cover cropping deserves more work. It, it, it needs more data before um, you know we could really push this as an important practice for growers to implement. Next, I'll talk about a compost application um, project, which was also a CDFA demonstration project. This one's still underway, and so I, I don't have as much data to show, but I'll just talk about it um, to give you an understanding for why we're working on it. Um, so AB 1826 um, was the law that went into effect that requires recycling of organic wastes. Um, it's expected that we're going to have a lot more compost production and we're going to need a place to put that compost. So alfalfa is a crop that has a large footprint by area over the state of California. And so it's a possible place where that compost could go. As a perennial crop, alfalfa has a high nutrient need. And as a high traffic crop, it's a crop that we drive over a lot. Um, soils can have poor physical conditions, um, especially over the, the subsequent years, three, four, five years that alfalfa is grown. So our questions of interest are, can compost improve soil structure and there, thereby um, improve soil water dynamics uh, or nutrient availability? And uh, what guidance can we give growers on compost application? So our treatments include a green waste compo compost applied at uh, three and six tons per acre versus a no compost control. Um, it's a 20 acre commercial field and those treatments are replicated three times. The compost here in this case is applied on the surface. So this was a, a first year stand of alfalfa at the start of this project. So no compost was actually incorporated into the soil. It's all, as you can see in the picture behind the words, it's all applied on the surface and then um, it's rain fed in. 
um, or, or watered in. And our hope, our anticipated benefits are that it could improve water infiltration and nutrient availability. Um, but some of the challenges we anticipated are uh, compost availability, even though this new law has gone into effect, compost is not um, so readily available just yet. And the timing of compost application. Sometimes these soil health um, uh, practices that we like to um, tout, um, the timing can, can be a big um, impedance to grower adoption. So these are some uh, preliminary results that were developed by um, one of the project leaders, Radimir Schmidt at UC Davis. Um, at the San Joaquin County site, uh, we haven't seen a statistical improvement in yield from the two compost treatments, but this is just one year of data. Um, and there does seem to be a trend of improved yield with six tons of compost per acre. So we'll see if that, if that develops more as, as time goes on. And then in terms of CO2 emissions, again, like the cover crop treatment, the compost seems to um, result in higher CO2 emissions from higher microbial activity. Um, but it looks like um, the compost may help to serve uh, the soil, the compost by improving soil could help to serve as a methane sink. So it would um, basically um, retain uh, carbon that would otherwise be emitted as methane. And some of the lessons learned and grower guidance, um, green waste compost is relatively cheap, but uh, the transport costs can be quite high. Um, the high demand for compost is in the fall season because growers like to apply it um, after crop harvest and ahead of the rainy season. But um, it can often be less available at that time when everybody wants it. So to ensure availability, um, we would recommend that they try to order it in the spring or the summer and store it on site until fall when they're ready to apply it. Of course, that means they have to have a place to store it. Um, but by buying it at this other, this earlier time of the year, um, we've learned that the compost generally is better quality. It has less trash in it because um, the processors are, are able to, to, to process it more. They're not just rapidly trying to get it out the door to the next buyer. Um, again, timing, timing, timing can be challenging. So trying to get that last harvest off of your alfalfa cutting that hay down low, and then um, spreading the compost ahead of a first rain. I mean, it, it, you're really just um, hoping the rain doesn't come too early, but that the rain eventually comes to help water it in. And again, not sure how long it'll take to realize some of the soil health or, or crop benefits. Um, soil health under deficit irrigation. This is another project that I've been working on with a team of folks at UC Davis. Um, and this, this work was um, financially supported by a grower group, the South Delta Water Agency. Um, growers have a keen interest in understanding how deficit irrigation might influence soil health. And so I was really um, excited to get their financial support um, as well as their cooperation on this work. Um, it just so happened that there was a project going on at UC Davis that was imposing different different deficit irrigation treatments on alfalfa. At the time, I started thinking about this problem. So the problem being that um, during drought, when water is less available, and there may even be regulatory curtailments that um, restrict growers' ability to apply water, um, growers have to make tough decisions on how they're gonna apply a scarce resource, their water resources. And some growers at, during that drought decided to cut back on um, alfalfa irrigation, knowing that alfalfa is deep rooted and is, has been found to be pretty resilient during drought. It may um, be impacted, but the yield may be impacted, um, but the stand can, can basically survive periods of drought. So the question I, I decided to ask was, well, the alfalfa may be resilient, but what about soil health? and deficit irrigation could serve as a proxy for drought. And then understanding, um, getting that understanding, then trying to fine tune our understanding with 
the amount of deficit and the timing of deficit and whether we might be able to develop some grower guidelines um, for perhaps how to impose deficit irrigation if, if the need arises. So the treatments are there on your screen. There was a full irrigation treatment of 100% of crop evapotranspiration. There were two treatments of 60% of crop evapotranspiration, but the timing of the, the restriction was different. Um, in one of those treatments, the timing was this severe cutoff about you know, midway to two thirds of the way through the season, after which time there was no water applied at all versus what we called a sustained deficit where the same amount of water was applied, but it was applied, it was kind of spoon fed over the course of the season. So each irrigation was um, cut back by some amount, um, but there was an irrigation applied throughout the season the way a grower would do say on a monthly basis. And then finally, the, the most severe treatment was this 40% of a crop evapotranspiration, again, uh, applied in this sustained deficit way. Um, we did soil sampling down to uh, three feet. Um, we looked at total carbon, nitrogen, salinity, compaction, bulk density, nitrogen mineralization, and active carbon. So this is kind of a suite of soil health characteristics that would be lumped into these chemical, physical, and biological categories that I talked about a few slides back. And our results are still preliminary, um, but what we're seeing is that deficit appears to negatively impact at least some soil health properties. So the graph on the left is this active carbon test. This is a biological test because active carbon is considered a, a carbon, a food source basically for, for microbes. And while there isn't a statistical difference among the 100% and both 60% ETC treatments, you can kind of see something playing out there among those um, where the sustained deficit, having water throughout the season seems to make a difference for this um, active carbon um, and having that food source available. The water seems to be important for microbial life. And then of course, the 40% treatment was a statistical difference, did decrease active carbon statistically. And then on the right-hand side, we see salinity. Uh, I'm sorry, the bars are opposite between the active carbon and the um, salinity test. So your 100% ETC is on the right side for salinity. And there we have the statistical difference um, where uh, we actually see that salinity is highest in that 60% ETC treatment that has the severe cutoff. And so that timing, that cutoff of, um, irrigation halfway, two thirds of the way through the season really impacted the salinity at the end of the season when we did our sampling and increased salinity um, in a statistical way. At this site, um, salinity is, is not a severe um, problem. This is generally not a site where we would be worried about salinity, but in other parts of the state where we would be worried about salinity, I think this is an important consideration for growers when they're thinking about how to apply um, deficit irrigation when the need arises. So lessons learned and grower guidance um, even if alfalfa is resilient during drought, cell, soil health uh, properties may not be, and it's the timing of the deficit that seems to be the most important thing to consider. Even if water is severely reduced, it's that severe cutoff in the, in the middle of the season that seems to impact soil throughout, toward the end of the season. Of course, the conundrum is that alfalfa yield seems to be better. This is work that was done by Dan Putnam um, alfalfa specialist. Alfalfa yield on an annual basis seems to be better in that cutoff treatment compared to the sustained deficit. This is not something I showed data for, but basically that early season watering is important for the alfalfa yield, but it seemed that the sustained amount, uh, uh, applying water in a sustained way throughout the season is important for the soil. 
So while it's kind of a conundrum, it's important for growers to know these trade-offs because maybe they can implement other management practices that could help mitigate the soil health impacts. And one of my keen interests is, is seeing how this work might have policy implications, primarily how um, water use prioritization uh, may impact soil conservation outcomes. So I, I did have a few slides about this Delta drought program. I know we're running up right against the time. Um, this is a partnership that developed uh, among several state agencies this year, and they asked me to be in a part of this program. Um, the background is to incentivize agricultural water users in the legal delta to take actions that are expected to reduce crop consumptive use. So again, thinking about how we can use scarce water resources this year. Um, our work is, is looking at um, how these um, practices, these incentivized practices result in, in water use savings and we'll be using um, open ET, uh, which is a, a public resource for looking at crop water use, um, looking at how uh, we, we might be um, realizing water savings through um, these practices. I'm gonna skip all the way through some of these more detailed slides on that program, but I welcome you to reach out to me if you, if you just wanna chat about what the program is all about. And with that, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to talk today. Um, I, I'm really, I really enjoy working in the Delta and I really enjoy working with the people in the Delta. It just has provided some really interesting opportunities to do science and it's a really um, stunning place uh, to work and to live. So thank you for your time today. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, oh my God, <laughs> you got your your hand all over the place. Um, yeah, and such a beautiful beautiful place to do research and live. Um, so it looks like we have a few questions in the chat, and um, looks David looks like you have a question you want to ask. Well, I'll defer to you, Safika. If you want me to go first, I will. Um, but you, those folks in the chat got their questions in before me. Okay, so yeah, let me let me read at least you know a few questions, and I will hold mine um, there. So, uh, Michelle, the first question is from Ben. What is the difference in quality of water delivered to the field and water pumped off the field? Uh, I'm guessing it's water pumped from the ground. No, I think what um, Ben's referring to is, um, you know, water falls by gravity onto the field. It's used for irrigation of crops. And then uh, to maintain that groundwater level below the crop root zone, um, water is pumped off and, and back into the channels. Oh. And um, I mean, Ben, I, I, I can't really answer your question. Um, I, I've looked at it in terms of salinity and basically the salinity is, is not changed uh, too much. Um, but in terms of other metrics, I can't really answer you on that, but certainly the um, Water Quality Coalition is out there monitoring water. Um, and, and I participate in that steering committee and sometimes there are hits for pesticides, but really um, uh, they're infrequent. Um, water quality is, is really quite good uh, in the Delta. So I'm not sure if you're referring more to like the nutrient side or the pesticide side, um, but uh, certainly on the pesticide side, um, the Water Coalition is looking at that. Well, that shows how little I know about Delta water management. Um, the, ne the next question is, were the cowpeas harvested for sale? Um, this is again from Ben. No, they weren't harvested for sale. So we... Um, the first year we did not terminate the crop early enough um, and they did go to seed, but generally with a cover crop, you don't want it to go to seed because then that seed gets incorporated into the soil and it could become a weed in the future. Um, and so, no, they, uh, with the exception of the first year when our timing was off, um, uh, they didn't even produce seed in the second and third years, which is what we would have wanted for all three years. 
Okay, David, you're next. Okay. Um, well, Michelle, I'll just say in general, it was a real pleasure and uh, we meaning California, but also cooperative extension are glad, lucky and glad you're where you are. Um, I'm really intrigued by your work with the compost. I, I think I'm, as much as I wanna get into the science of what you're working on, I just wanna hear more about the implications and you being in the middle of where I think, at least from my perspective, there was a lack of compost for a long time and folks were struggling to find it to now there's a lack of land to apply it. You, I'm kind of quoting you. So can you describe the dynamic you're experiencing, how you're navigating some of this? Well, I, you know, I may have misspoken in or misconveyed what I was trying to convey. I think there's, there's probably not a lack of land of where to apply it, um, but it's, it's getting people on board to apply it. So, I mean, compost is, is probably cheaper now than it has been in the past. Um, and so as an input, the, the cost of it, and certainly the transport cost of it in the past and, and even to the present was um, the inhibiting factor. Um, but I think with the new law, there's gonna be more compost than we've seen in the past. <laughs> Yeah. Therefore, the land issue could become a problem, or at least land managed by people who are willing to foot the bill of it, right? Yeah. And and certainly CDFA has the Healthy Soils Program, which is helping to cost share some of that. So that might help to get people right. over that, that hump of cost. Um, and again, it's primarily the transport cost to get the, the compost to the site. Yeah, and I probably misquote. I, I, I'm experiencing a demand for land to apply compost. I, um, I don't know that there's a lack. I shouldn't have said it that way either. So, yeah. Well, it could just be, it, and, and David, I, I won't really pretend to be an expert on all of this, but, but it could just be that where it's produced and the transport cost of getting it to the land, right? And that could be what makes... Um, and that could be the hump, right? That we need to get over is that it's produced somewhere, but there's not enough land near to where it's produced. So we'll we'll see. Yeah. No. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have like a, a very specific question, and again, I don't really know much about the delta, and I was just curious, um, just seeing some of the results that you presented, both on the cover crop as well as on the on the manure application. Is it like the some of the negative results or, or the results that you're not expecting you you were saying simply driven by the local condition i mean these are organic rich soils with silo water table so you are applying you know manure or cover crop or legumes in particular uh, maybe that's not the best place to do it well i think cover crops when it what i'm hearing from growers is that uh, among this this you know grouping of soil health practices that are being funded by CDFA, for example, um, cover cropping seems to be the, the more challenging fruit to bite off. Um, and I think it's primarily a timing issue. I mean, I talked about timing with the compost application. There's, there's challenges with that, but the cover cropping, I think, is where growers really face timing challenges and um, th those, those challenges, they're reality. Um, they may be more severe in some years versus others, um, but I think they could be, um, just the thought of the timing challenges might be enough to inhibit people from trying cover cropping. Yeah. compared to compost, where the challenge is probably in a shorter window of time. Again, you want to harvest the crop, you want to apply compost, and then you hope for rain. Yeah. But with cover cropping, you've got potential for rain, you've got when am I going to plant this thing, when am I going to terminate this thing, when am I going to get my cash crop in? It's just the timing issues are way bigger and broader than, say, with compost. So. Um, there, there could be site conditions that, that led to the, the results that we saw, but there could have been management things too that 
um, led that that were in large part uh, related to timing, but also just um, things being different from the status quo, right? A, yeah. a piece of ground that was primarily fallowed every summer between small grains going to, oh my gosh, I got to plant something here. Oh my gosh, I got to put water on this thing. Oh my gosh, I got to terminate this thing. And oh my gosh, I got to plant my cash crop. <laughs> Well, nicely put. Um, so I think we are over time. So I'm going to uh, end the, the webinar yeah. here. And again, uh, join me in thanking Michelle one more time for, for taking the time and, and really um, giving this wonderful talk. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining. Yeah. Take care. Bye.